I'm Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator here at Kelly Ryder's house, and I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, every year we get to invite a contemporary fiction writer to read at the Writer's House in memory of beloved Penn professor Robert Bob Lucid, who taught at Penn for 32 years from 1964 until 30 years after that, uh, 1996, and whose visionary spirit and infectious enthusiasm infused the Writer's House from its beginning. Very much. Bob Lucid is in our memory. Uh, this program's featured Ken Kalfas, Ben Marcus, Lydia Davis, who is also a fellow this year. If you have an RSVP for the fellows program, you should uh, come see Lydia Davis, uh, Stuart Dybeck, and others, and gives us the opportunity to bring amazing authors to the writer's house, thanks to the generous support of Susan Savitsky, Ed Kane, and the Kelly Writer's House community. This year, we're very, very, very excited to have Alexandra Kleeman as our featured reader. Alexander Kleeman lives in Staten Island. Her short fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Zoetrope All Story, Conjunctions, Bomb, The White Review, and Guernica. Her nonfiction has appeared in Harper's, L, Tin House, and M Plus One. She won the 2016 Bard Prize, Bard Fiction Prize, and she's a finalist for the prestigious Young Lions Award from the New York Public Library. Kleeman's novel, You Too Can Have a Body Like Mine, came out last year to wild acclaim because it's amazing. And tonight we get to celebrate her new work, a collection of short stories called Intimations. Right here, we have it for sale for $15 uh, out there. So it's a great opportunity to buy the book. Um, both books share a dreamlike quality where nothing, especially real seeming things, seem real. Uh, <laughs> though uh, I really like the quote, apparently everyone else does, too, from the New York Times that says, uh, like an alien intent on some meticulous anthropological mission on Earth, Alexander Kleeman seems always to be encountering the world for the first time. She feels very creepy and also accurate in a, in a great way. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome Alexander Kleeman up here. Thanks so much, Allie. Um, I'm so excited to be here, uh, especially when I was an undergrad and when I was studying um, poetry, uh, I would go on to the Kelly Writers House like, archives and just listen to people read all the poems I was reading, like uh, Charles Bernstein, May May Bergie, and I was always wondering, you know, what is this place, the Kelly Writers House? <laughs> what is it like? And um, I did not expect it to smell so good, <laughs> like, uh, like cookies always being made. Um, I'm going to read uh, a whole story from Intimations, but because I'm in Philly and um, my first novel, uh, You Two Can Have a Body Like Mine, features candy cakes prominently, I thought I'd read just a little section, um, a little candy cake ad, um, because I think that they are Pennsylvania or even Philadelphia-based uh, <laughs> snack. Yeah. Tasty cakes, yeah. Um, I originally wanted to call these um, sort of mystical, mysterious, kind of uh, malicious snack cakes, tasty cakes, and um, Candy Calf was going to be Tasty Cat. And then I found out that this company already existed, and I was like, I've got to change it. I've got to change it to something that no one would ever name a product because it's too out there. And I chose Candy Cakes, and of course, that is a product made by Tasty Cakes. So I just failed twice. Um, <laughs> but really, there is no better name, I think, for it than Candy Cakes. Um, in my book, uh, I think they might sort of resemble actual candy cakes on the outside, um, but on the inside, they are much more complicated. <laughs> the TV was showing another commercial for candy cakes. This commercial was one of the newer series of ads that mixed animated and live action components. In this new series, Candy Cat would often successfully chase down or otherwise achieve contact with the snack cakes, but the cakes were always pictured as live action, three-dimensional objects, while the cat was a flat cartoon. The gag each time was that no matter how hard he tried, Candy Cat could never put a candy cake down his throat. The two types of matter were fundamentally incompatible. This went along with an advertising campaign centered around the point that candy cakes were made of real stuff. Maybe not natural stuff, but definitely genuine three-dimensional material from our physical universe that was similar to us in ways it might not be to bodies from a cartoon world. In this commercial, Candy Cat walks wobbly through a cartoon landscape full of dancing trees. 
The trees are shaking their middles and singing the candy cakes jingle as little birds play bells and maracas in their branches. You can see every rib on Candy Cat's brownish body as he wobble skips through the woods, having what appears to be a pleasant day. He looks fairly carefree, oblivious to his hunger and to the words being chanted all around him by the living trees, when suddenly he happens upon a plate of candy cakes sitting in the clearing in the middle of the forest, three-dimensional and super real among the painted foliage, glowing with a sparkly light that is not real, not cartoon, but something in between. In rapid sequence, he spasms through shock, surprise, delight, disbelief, delight again, and then crippling hunger. His ribs throb. And when he reaches out for the platter, you actually see his emaciation in motion. The skin sags a little off the forearm. The bones and tendons of the arm show starkly with a little drop shadow under them to heighten the effect. His eyes grow larger and whiter in their huge cartoon sockets. At this moment, I just want so badly for him to just take one of those revolting cakes and shove it all the way into his belly. Anything, anything to anchor his body a little bit. But when his hand finally reaches the plate and grabs for a candy cake, none of the cakes will budge. It's hard to describe. It looks like Candy Cat's hand is touching them through the glow, but they aren't affected at all. It's not like they're a photo, but more like they're impossibly heavy, so he'll need something else to move them. So Candy Cat runs out of the frame and gets a comically large fork, and he aims it at the plate and stabs down, but the fork just seems to pass through them as though they're made of nothing. And Candy Cat stabs more slowly and then picks the fork up and looks at it, confused. Then he runs back out of the frame and returns with an ax, which just does the same thing, nothing, no matter how many times he hacks away at the plate. Meanwhile, the forest is getting pretty torn up. And when he runs back out of the frame and comes back, he's got tons of dynamite, which he sets up all around the cakes and detonates in a huge explosion that turns all the trees and birds black with little white eyes blinking in stunned disbelief. The platter of cakes glows more handsomely than ever against the scorched background. And finally, Candy Cat just yanks his mouth open with his two hands, painfully wide with a cracking sound, and jumps mouth first onto the plate and the cakes, trapping their glow inside his mouth as he lies on the forest floor. His mouth is kind of suctioned to the ground now, and he struggles very carefully to close it, drawing the lips together, biting into the soil to prevent any precious morsel from being left behind. And he closes slowly on a mouthful of dirt and plate and cakes. He stands up shaking, his mouth full, there are big bite marks in the cartoon soil where his teeth have gouged away at the earth. And tentatively, he bites down. It doesn't even make a sound. Confusion shows on his face, and he bites again and again, more rapidly. Nothing. Then, stretching his throat out to the appropriate width, he tries to swallow the plate whole again and again. Nothing. Finally, disheartened, he spits out the plate. The cake's perfect and intact, still with that weird magical glow on everything, though now the glow has something smug about it. Candy Cat looks toward the screen, and his eyes have a new wetness to them. Candy cakes, the screen reads. Real stuff, real good. So <laughs> there are a lot of ads like that that go through the book. Um, as our narrator becomes more and more fascinated with the idea of getting at these cakes and, and eating them, um, so this book of short stories uh, compiles stories that I wrote over the last, I guess, six or seven years. Um, while I was writing this novel, before I was writing this novel, after I was writing this novel, <laughs> which is a lot of time. And um, there's a secret, you know, a secret ordering system that I should post somewhere that shows the chronological order in which these were written. So it would show me um, becoming interested in one particular style of writing, then becoming frustrated that like the next story I was starting was just replicating that style, so pushing against a new direction. So there are a lot of stories here that feel like dreams, like waking up into um, someone else's dream that you don't really recognize. 
Um, there are stories in here that are sort of thought experiments um, about the body and matter and angels and uh, rabbits, things like that. <laughs> angels and rabbits. Um, and then there are some stories that sort of deal with more realistic problems. Um, I have three in the center about the same character um, sort of taking her temperature at different times in her life. Um, because one thing that always used to frustrate me when I was um, reading short stories was you, you meet a character, you get involved with them, you sort of become invested in them, and then the story ends 20 pages later, and you have no idea what happens. Like, did that experience change them, or um, did it, as I think is more true to human experience, not because you have to make the same mistake over and over again, I think, for it to really dig in. <laughs> um, but this story that I'm going to read uh, is called You Disappearing. It is um, based sort of on a thought experiment that I had one day. Um, I was thinking about uh, how much I love disaster movies <laughs> and how much I love post-apocalyptic fiction and all of these things. Um, and I was thinking about how showy all of these disasters are. Like, um, it's a giant tidal wave, or it's a volcano, or it's, um, whoa, <laughs> it's a torrential downpour. <laughs> um, but many disasters, I think, actually erode um, life in a much subtler, much quieter, and much more difficult uh, to perceive way. <laughs> so um, I asked myself, what would it be like to um, experience an apocalypse that's happening extremely quietly, extremely gradually, with things just vanishing one by one? Um, and that is this story, <laughs> You Disappearing. When I went downstairs this morning and found Cookie missing, I knew that official emergency procedure called for me to phone all the information in to the Bureau of Disappearances. At the prompting of the pre-recorded voice, I would enter my social security number and zip code. I would press two to report the sudden absence of an animal, three for a domestic animal, and then at the sound of the tone, I would speak the word cat clearly and audibly, into the telephone receiver. The woman's voice would then give a short parametric definition of a cat, and if this definition matched my missing item, I could press the pound sign to record a 15-second description. A three-note melody would let me know that my claim had been filed, and then that lovely pre-recorded voice would read out my assigned case number, along with some instructions on how to update or cancel my claim. Instead, I picked up the phone and pushed your number into it. I was always telling you about problems you couldn't fix, as though multiplying badness could dilute it. Cookie's gone, I said, and waited for your response. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Have you phoned it in, you asked. Your voice was casual, like it was someone else's pet entirely, a pet from a faraway land owned by people we'd never meet. I didn't, I said. I'm kind of depressed, I added. I was often depressed, but now we all had better reasons to be. I'm sorry, he said back. Cookie loved to chew on wires, I said. I know, you said. You didn't say you wish you could be here. I didn't say it either. There was nothing more to say. I hung up the phone. Sometimes I dialed you back right away just to hear you pick up and know that your hands were, at that very moment, resting on a chunk of plastic that threaded its way delicately to me over hundreds of miles of wire and cord. To know that even though your voice had disappeared, you had not yet. But recently I hadn't been allowing myself any callbacks. I was getting more afraid of the day when you wouldn't pick up. The apocalypse was quiet. It had a way about it, a certain charm. It could be called graceful. It was taking a long time. People prepared for an apocalypse that they could take up arms against, bunker down with. People hoarded filtered water, canned corn, dry milk, batteries. 
They published books on how to get things done in the new post world, a world that they always imagined as being much like our own, only missing one or two key things. They might imagine, for example, that survivors would emerge onto a planet stripped of all vegetable and plant life. First, the animals would grow vicious and then starve. It would be important to hoard as many of these animals as possible, pack them in salt, and hide them away to keep. You'd want to have a supply of emergency seed to grow in a secure location, maybe using sterilized soil that you had already hoarded. Then you'd want to gather a crew. One muscle man with a heart of gold, a scientist type, an engineer, a child, and somebody that you thought maybe you could love if you survived long enough to love them. Nobody thought the apocalypse would be so polite and quirky. Things just popped out of existence like they had forgotten all about themselves. Now when you misplaced your keys, you didn't go looking for them. Maybe you went to your landlord and asked for the spare set, took them to the hardware store and made two copies this time, an extra in case the disappearing wasn't a one-off but part of a trend. Or maybe you took this as a sign and decided to leave instead walked out directionless into the world to find your own vanishing point, which meant moving to Chicago to stay with your brother, who still had the keys to his house and a spare set to give you. It was cute the way this apocalypse zapped things out of existence one by one. It was so clean and easy, like clicking on a little box to close an internet browser window. It had a sense of humor. A fat man walking down the street lined with small abandoned shops would look down and find that his trousers had vanished, bearing his out-of-season Halloween boxers to the public. That kind of humor. Videos of things like this used to show up all the time on the internet, until the internet went. I thought I would visit the Ferris wheel at the pier before it vanished. I didn't know when it would go. I had the idea that I could try to be the last person ever to visit it, but that would require a lot of work, a lot of waiting around and watching, and there were things to do even in the time of last things. I put two apples in a plastic bag and headed out the door, which I didn't lock even though it would have been easy to do. I took the elevator down to the first floor and walked on East Jackson Drive to the edge of the water, then up along the highway, holding onto the handrail with one gloved hand. A sedan full of teenagers drove by, and one of them shouted a blurry word at me that sounded like it had once been a taunt. It was winter, but it wasn't so cold. There was less weather, the same way there was less of everything. This day resembled the day before. Sleepy air and wan blue sky. No clouds, but a vague, foggy white that might just have been a thinning of the atmosphere. At the pier, I saw the seagulls huddling together on the boardwalk, pressing their dirty white bodies up against each other. They seemed able to eat anything, crusts, rinds, paper napkins. They were made to survive, even in a fading world that was unthinking itself faster than we could fill it back up with our trash. One seagull worked to swallow a little plastic toy lion, snapping its beak down on it with blunt patience. The Ferris wheel loomed up big behind them at the end of the pier, though it wasn't as big as it had seemed the first time I saw it. The wheel missing spokes at random. Some of the red seating cars had gone. It looked like the mouth of someone who had been punched over and over again in the face. I walked over to it, right out in the open, but nobody saw me. When I reached the base, the controls were all locked up. It had a big, goofy lever that you could set to different speeds, like in a cartoon. I ducked the chain and climbed into the ground-level car, the one in starting position, and staggered from one side of the car to the other to try to make it swing, but it wasn't any fun. Then I sat facing the water and put down the guardrail. The lake looked at the shore the way it used to. When water disappears, other water rushes in right away to take its place. You never see any kind of hole or gap. Then when I reached into my plastic bag, I only had one apple. This apocalypse disappears objects of all kinds, and it swallows memories whole, too. I didn't want to be around you when you forgot me. I didn't want to watch it fall out of your head so easily. I was hoping to forget you first. 
but sometimes I second-guessed that. Then I called you and tried to be angry, as though you were the one who had been so afraid of being forgotten that you needed to move out of the apartment, out of the city, and into another city where nothing had any familiarity to start with or any familiarity to lose. I thought you might have forgotten who did what to whom, but you haven't yet. When the first things began to disappear, it had looked funny, like a continuity slip up in a bad movie. You and I would make sound effects for them, shouting poof or boink as some flowers blinked themselves out of existence right in front of us. This was how we'd make each other laugh. In those days, the world still looked full, even though it was emptying fast. Then too many things vanished to keep making the sounds. We saw it was sad that anything in the world had gone and could not return. You joked around, saying there'd be fewer chores, our lives would clean up after themselves for a change. But still, you went around doing the dishes, vacuuming the little spaces around and under the furniture, putting on a fresh shirt every day, making the bed. You folded cups out of paper for us to drink from when the glasses went away. And when the paper went, you used the nice cloth napkins, which worked badly. You were the sort of person that keeps it all going, and I was the other kind. This became clear two weeks after the first vanishings, when the news stations termed it the disapocalypse. On the day they called it irreversible, I walked out of the office just before lunch. I didn't tell anybody where I was going, I didn't reply to the emails asking whether we wanted to cancel health insurance and cash out retirement plans. I knew I wouldn't be coming back. The subway was shut down, so I walked all the way to our apartment on Myrtle Avenue, across the Brooklyn Bridge to the Flatbush Extension. On that day, the world still felt crowded. The sky above was a pure, undiluted blue, thick enough to mask how much emptiness lay behind it out past the atmosphere. Cars were lined up on the bridge, bumper to bumper. Drivers honked sporadically, without aggression, like migrating geese. When I got home, it was late afternoon and you'd be back by 6.30. I tried reading the newspaper, but I'd read all I could stand about the vanishing, and the other sections had been thinning out some with blank patches nobody bothered to fill where the color of the paper showed through, grayish and soft. Then it was 7.30 and 8, and still you weren't around. I gave Cookie her dry food and filled her water. I started crying and stopped again, and then dragged eyeliner back over my lids so that I looked the way I had before. When you showed up, it was close to 9, and you smelled normal, no sweat, no cigarettes, no liquor. Where had you been? You had been working late. Hadn't you heard? They said irreversible, imminent, end of days. They used those words. I put wet marks into your shirt as you held me. Then when I pulled away, your chest looked back at me with two blurry eyes. Why did you do that, I asked. Why were you away so long? I was working, you said. A lot of people have left, you know that. Toby and Marianne and all the interns. We're understaffed. I'm on two new building projects. Your back was warm and real under my hands. There's nothing to build, I said. The world is going. I know that, you replied. But there isn't anything we can do about it. That's what I'm saying, I said. I looked at you looking at me. I heard that we were saying the same thing, though I didn't understand how it was possible for us to mean it so differently. Later that night, I asked you to quit your job too. Stay home with me during the days. We could get survival ready, rent a garden level apartment with barricadable windows. We could walk around all day getting to know the things that wouldn't be there for much longer. But you wouldn't. You liked being an architect. You said it would make you happy to have added even one thing to a world now headed for total subtraction. The walking path next to the highway passed under a bridge. 
In the cool dark beneath was a bench facing onto some empty lot full of broken glass from bottles that people had thrown just because. When sunlight hit the broken pat patches, the ground lit up like a reverse chandelier, a glittering patch of green and white. Now there was less the each time I walked by. Also, no bench. I stood there facing the glass, eating my last apple. There had been times when I thought I might be with you indefinitely, something approaching an entire life. But then when there was only a finite amount of time, a thing we could see the limit of, I wasn't so sure. I didn't know how to use a unit of time like this, too long for a game of chess or a movie, but so much shorter than we had imagined. It felt like one of those days when we woke up too late for breakfast and lay in bed until it was too late for lunch. Those days made me nervous. On those days, we fought about how to use our time. You didn't want to live your life under pressure, as though we'd run out, as though it were the last days. I'm not ill, you said. We aren't dying. We don't have cancer, you said. So I don't want to live like we do, you said. There are two kinds of people, and one of them will give up first. When we fought, you got over it first. I'd watch you from the kitchen, through a rectangular space cut into the wall, and I could see you studying the newspaper, ducking your head down to read small details in the photographs. I saw how gracefully you fell back into whatever article you'd been reading before. Even then I knew, whatever hollow I made in you if I left would heal like a hole sunk into water quick as water, rushing to fill some passing wound. This far from the pier, I could still hear the seagulls fighting over scraps, calling out with their harsh voices. Sounds carried farther these days, tearing through the thin air like a stone thrown as hard as you can toward the sea. The bitten down apple core wet my right hand glove, while with the other hand I pressed on the bridge of my nose. There are two kinds of people, one will only weep when the possibility exists, however remote, that someone will hear them. I put the core of the apple down on the ground and looked at it. Poof, I said. I waited for something to happen. Then I went and walked back up the path toward the high rise. When I got home, I collected all of Cookie's toys, her food bowl and water bowl, the little purple ball with a bell in it, the stuffed, squeaking duck that was almost her size. I lined them up all in the mantle in the living room so I could watch them disappear one after the other. Was the disappearing growing faster every day? No. Was it moving geographically from west to east or east to west? Was it vanishing the world alphabetically, taxonomically, or in chronological order? It wasn't. As hard as we tried to understand it, there didn't seem to be much order to the disappearing at all. A week would go by with everything pretty much in its proper place, and then all of a sudden there was no such thing as magazines, not in your home or anyone else's, and nobody to bother making new ones. Did it work its way down from the biggest things to the smallest? Was there a plan? When you were in the right mood, when you were too tired to care much, it was beautiful, like watching the house across the street as someone walked through it, turning each of the lights off in order, one by one, for the night. I sat on the floor of my brother's empty living room and ate four chocolate chip granola bars in a row. I had already called you once today, but I was working on a reason to call you again. Experts suggested that the things disappearing most quickly now might be intangible, metaphysical. Concepts, memories, and modes of thought were just as vulnerable to erasure, they said, though they couldn't give any concrete examples. I thought I'd better call you to see if you still remembered that Cookie had gone. I pushed the buttons in order. It rang twice, and then I heard you. Hello, you said. It's me, I said. It's you, you said back to me. I just wanted to call to see if you still remembered Cookie, I said. 
Of course I still remember Cookie, you said. There was silence on both of our ends, a blur of static on the line between us. What do you remember? I asked. I remember that you picked her because she bit you, you said, and you decided it was important that you win this one animal over. I remember that you didn't know how to hold a cat at the beginning, so you grabbed her just anywhere. You grabbed her in the middle and tried to pick her up that way. You got bit a lot, you added. I have your number memorized, I said. That's good, you said. And I said I should let you go. And you said good night, and we hung up on each other. I miss you more now than I had when I lost you. I was forgetting the bad things faster than I forgot the good, and the changing ratio felt a little bit like falling in love, even though I was actually speaking to you less and less. I used to play a game I called, Are We Going to Make It? You were playing too, whether you knew it or not. It worked like this. You'd forget that we were going to see the movie together, and you'd go by yourself instead or with a friend while I waited at home. Or you'd stay at work until four in the morning and forget to charge your phone, and you'd wake me up on the couch where I'd fallen asleep trying to stay up for you. Then I would ask myself, are we going to make it? And the next thing, whatever thing you did next, would become the answer, a murky thing that I'd study until I was too tired to think about it anymore. An independent physicist living in Arizona had become famous for his theories on how the disappearing might be a sort of existential illusion, analogous to an optical illusion. He said that the fact that we still remember what's been taken and can picture it in our minds is proof that it still exists. It's like how you only see the duck or the bunny at a given moment, never both, he said. Only imagine that instead of knowing that the bunny exists alongside your experience of the duck, you believe that it's been irrevocably lost. It's all about vantage point, he said. Temporal vantage point. The way you might lose sight of your house when you drive away from it, but find it again when you look for it from the top of a hill. To think your house was lost, he said, would be loony. Disappeared things were like this, he said, coexistent but obscured in time. This was his theory of spatiotemporal obstruction. Those who believed in it believed that there was one special place that offered temporal higher ground. They made pilgrimages to a particular beach in Normandy where the cliffs were chalky white, the color of doves, and where it was rumored that recently disappeared things sometimes reappeared, soft-edged and worn and looking 30 or 40 years older. In 1759, a 12-year-old girl was said to have drowned herself there to avoid marriage to a much older man. I sat on the floor and put the granola bar wrappers in a plastic bag. I put the plastic bag inside another plastic bag. Plastic bags were disappearing too, but my brother had had so many of them to begin with. Then I picked up the phone to call you back. I put your number in from memory. Instead of you, I heard an error song and a recorded voice telling me my call could not be completed. I dialed the Bureau of Disappearances. At the prompt, I pressed one for person, then one again for male. I pressed three to indicate age 21 to 30. Then I was supposed to press three for friend, but instead I pressed two for lover or significant other. I hoped you wouldn't mind. The beautiful female voice declared you a male lover between the ages of 21 and 30 and asked if that was correct. I pressed the pound key, and then I described you. I remember it was a bright morning in the fall, and I woke onto your face looking in on mine. Some mornings when we woke together, we pretended that one of us had forgotten who the other was. One of us had become an amnesiac. That one would ask, who are you? Where am I? And it was the other's job to make up a new story. A good story was long, and the best stories could make me feel like I had gotten a whole second life, a bonus one. Yellow leaves outside the window threw yellowish light on the sheets as you told me not to worry. I was safe. I was with you. We had been living together since grad school, 
We met on the hottest day of the year near the gondolas in the middle of the park. We were sitting on benches facing the pond and eating the same kind of sandwich, turkey and Swiss in a spinach wrap. But that's what actually happened, I said. I know, he said, making a fake guilty face. In the fall afternoon, leaves fell off whenever they fell off. It didn't depend on whether their color or weight or force of the wind outdoors. You added, I just couldn't think of anything. The disappearing when it started happening was everywhere, subtly. It hung on our days the way a specific hour does on a moment, dragging it down and reminding you of how much time you've left past. It was a flavor you woke up with in your mouth, like the taste of blood on a dry winter morning. This made leaving easier in the moments before I had realized what I was planning to do. I stood outside our building with no keys, and I was calling you over and over on the cell phone even though I knew you were at work. Each time I got your voicemail, I imagined that you had vanished, until one time I imagined that you had vanished and I didn't feel any way about it. It was like I had disappeared. I saw the things continuing on without me and I didn't mind. I went to the ATM on the corner and pulled everything out of my checking account. Checking accounts were still around then, existing invisibly somewhere. I took the cash in our car and got on the highway driving on I-80 West toward Chicago. If it hadn't been the end of days, would we still be together? The most difficult thing about leaving you was discovering that I went on, that I had to be there 16 hours a day watching myself live my own life, that I had to stay near myself all the time as I asked myself question after question, that I had to sit there in my body and watch the phone ring over and over next to me that night after you had gotten home. After the announcement, people did one of two things. Either they tried to care more, or they tried caring less. They decided to survive, to collect and hide and ration, or they decided to let the amount of time left in their lives work away at them. They tried to grow vegetables in their small backyards, or they let the yard get overgrown, falling asleep drunk in the afternoon on a lawn chair encircled by weeds. For a while, we did whatever we had chosen with dedication. But it was difficult to stay dedicated for more than a few weeks, and eventually we middled, caring about things sloppily and in spurts. We poked at the dirt and then fell asleep, feeling that we should have done more, or maybe less. In the end, there was only one kind of person. In the master bedroom, I turned down the sheets. My brother wouldn't be back again, but I made the, the bed every day to be a good guest. I made it the hotel way, everything tucked in, the sheets stretched tight across the mattress and leaving no room to shift or wrinkle. Sleeping in it meant that you had to tear it all apart. I yanked the pillows out from underneath the blankets, pulled the sheets down to the foot of the bed, let the comforter fall to the floor. Then I climbed in. I have one of the last working phones, I said out loud. I had started sleeping with the lights on. I wanted more minutes of seeing, more things I could see if I happened to open my eyes. Outside the window, there was snow falling, falling like movie snow, all the dreamy, fluffy bits drifting around in the light of a single street lamp. I wished that I loved the woman on the disappearance hotline so that I could call and hear her voice anytime I wanted and feel that feeling that it didn't seem I'd be feeling again. Whoever loved her was lucky if they were still around. I watched the snow slow down, thin out, then it was two or three pieces at a time, falling reversibly, wavering up and down and up again like they didn't know where to go. The light stayed on for a few minutes. I saw my reflection in the window. Then the bulb blanked out overhead. In the dark, I could hear the cord swinging empty above, but I saw nothing. I knew from the mounting silence that other things were vanishing too. They say everything in the world vibrates at its own specific frequency. Each thing releases a tiny bit of sound. But nothing, nothing doesn't vibrate at all. 
I felt the heat radiating from my body with no place to go. Dots of darkness that weren't really there drifted past my eyes. How would I know I was vanishing if there were nobody around to see me? What would tell me that I wasn't just falling asleep? In the darkness, I couldn't see the disappearing any longer, but I knew it was all going, going far, far away, until gradually I didn't even know that anymore. There was a woman in Lincoln, Nebraska, who claimed to be able to communicate with the disappeared. You could call her on the telephone and tell her who you were looking for, their full name, how old, how tall, how heavy. She would go out to the old well behind her house, a well that her grandfather had built decades earlier, and shout that information deep down into it. In the echo that came back, they said you could hear whispers from the other side, your loved ones grabbing and molding the shouted words, distorting them to say what they needed said. You had to pay her in real gold, jewelry or bullion. It had to gleam. She wished we could hear their voices as she did, how happy they are, how they miss us. She said that everything that disappeared from our side went over to theirs, where they kept living normal lives, waiting for the things still lingering with us to join them and make the world whole once more. It's Yeah. General questions, specific questions? Any questions? I notice um, in the story the characters were referred to as, um, uh, like the main character referred to, um, like I, me, um, and the lover was you. Yeah, yeah. Um, had their names disappeared or was that just a choice? <laughs> well, I mean, um, uh, I didn't decide specifically that their names had disappeared, but definitely like stripping that layer off is a way, I think, of making um, the world feel different, to feel um, less uh, pinned down, less realistic, less full of specifiers and, and dividers. Yeah, um, and then in my novel, I also don't have names, but for sort of a different reason. So there are many good reasons not to name things <laughs> in people. Yeah. That's a great question. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Just a really quick question. How much of this did you end up writing at Bard? <laughs> well, um, actually, uh, so most of this collection was already done by the time I got there, and I had left myself one last mission, and that was to write um, a, a story about this character I had created, Karen, who comes back and back um, and write it about uh, a moment in her life where she almost makes a relationship exploding mistake. Um, so that's a story that I wrote when I was at Bard, and it took me all semester to do it. <laughs> I write very slowly. <sighs> yeah. are, are any of you guys short story writers yourself, or are you working on longer things? Um, who thinks it's harder to write a short story than a longer thing? And who thinks, yeah, short stories are harder? Anyone? Okay. <laughs> That's good to hear. Anyone think a novel is harder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so half and half, right. Well, they are both hard, I guess. <laughs> and I think, like, the hard thing is that they require, like, opposite things from you. Like, with a short story... It kind of is to get it perfect. It, it is possible to get it perfect, or as perfect as you yourself can make it. You can get down to the sentence level and the word level, like trying to get every little molecule in place. And if you do that when you're writing a novel, you're going to drive yourself crazy, <laughs> um, because you know, I think every novel has some extra built into it. You know, like um, uh, some stuff that doesn't really further the plot that doesn't really tell you something brand new about the characters, um, that doesn't seem like it absolutely has to be there. But then that thing, too, is part of what makes the novel, I think, so much fun to read, because it's like a world. It's got all this stuff in it that doesn't need to be there. Um, 
Yeah, so you have to be gentler on yourself when you write a novel, and you have to think of it as a marathon and a, a long-distance run, I guess. Yeah? Um, <laughs> sorry, right sorry. You. Um, one thing that really interested me about kind of the story that you just read, You Disappearing, and your novel is your use of makeup. And you, uh, you didn't read anything in from the novel about that, but yeah. in You Disappearing, you kind of talk about it as a way to reclaim some sort of specificity and identity. And in your novel, you often use it as a way to distort identity and kind of craft it. And so I'm yeah. trying to phrase this as a question, but I'm really interested in what you think about that duality. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, that's such a good question. And part of the reason that that comes up, I think, is because um, when I was beginning to write the novel, the challenge I posed to myself was like, um, you know, you, you make all these worlds that are, are dreamlike, simplified, sort of uh, rounded down, um, and you don't actually put any things in your writing that you do on a daily basis, like, um, you know, like trimming your fingernails or, or like putting on sunscreen or whatever it is. Um, and I asked myself why I was doing that. Is it because I don't think that what I do in my life is worthy of like a literary look? Um, so I was thinking a lot about bringing in these sort of everyday things when I was writing the novel and when I was writing that story, which happened about um, halfway through the novel. Um, and yeah, I, I think like, you get different facets um, of whatever topic you build into your work. Like um, from a from sort of some sort of like psychological level, what really interests me about makeup is that um, uh, it's this complex r ritual that we have been taught to do, and that is modeled for us all around us. Um, and uh, you can you can relate to it in a way that expresses very little of your personal specificity, I think. You can like read all the tutorials and um, find out what you're supposed to do, and then you can do the same thing to yourself that every good makeupper does. Um, so there's that way in which it sort of sands down the specificity of your face, I think. Um, and uh, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> like um, I think that it's also um, it's also a cool sort of ritualistic thing, you know. Like uh, if I um, have to be around a lot of people, I like to put eyeliner on because it makes me feel like I'm wearing clothes on my face instead of being naked in public, <laughs> um, and uh, it collects me. And it's sort of like um, I don't have time to draw or paint very much anymore, so I get to paint a face onto my face. Um, but yeah, in, in the story, it definitely works as a um, uh, a gesture through which my narrator shows that she's trying to compose herself, and in composing herself and getting herself ready to like interact with this other person again, uh, she undoes the feelings that she was just feeling. Okay? But definitely, like I think, like makeup always changes how you relate to the world and how you relate to your self. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a, a question about names, too. You have a couple of stories in addition to the novel with just the letters uh, where you don't name the characters. Do you find it, how do you approach keeping characters in your mind when they're nameless? Does it change if they have yeah. names? Um, well, I, I've always found it, found it really difficult to name characters. I think some people are good at it, but um, uh, I never felt like my name really fit me. And um, when I try to name a character, like you know, uh, every name says so much about what implies so much about what that person would be like. I don't necessarily know if I want to take on all that baggage. So in my novel, um, my main characters are A, the narrator, B, um, her roommate, and C. Um, her boyfriend, and um, in one sense, just giving them these uh, letter names to me, like it differentiates them, like plotting them on a map or um, plotting them at the points of a triangle. They're kind of a triangle, um, 
but it also moves them uncomfortably close to one another because um, what differentiates the letter A from the letter B? Just an order that we've gotten used to, right? It's just the first one and the second one, but you can imagine very easily like a slightly, slightly parallel version of our world where B would come first and then A, <laughs> and we wouldn't even know the difference. Like it would just be some different sounds. So. Um, it, it separates them, but it also pushes them together in this sort of weird and muddy way. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that makes it like, oh, thank you. For me, that makes it like both hyper relatable, but also. Um, really like abstract ideas or like yeah, yeah. your writing I feel like is super rich with both of those things or the combination of both like thought experiments like you said. Yeah. Has that always, I'm sure you've written a million things in your life, but has that always felt like your voice? Yeah. Um, I think that like, I actually feel like I've only probably written like 40 things <laughs> maybe in my whole life. <laughs> um, and uh it, it isn't that when I um, was really young, I was like, um, I'm really interested, like I wasn't a child going, I'm really interested in this space between dreams and reality. Um, but that would have been a cool thought to have. Um, <laughs> I think we like, um, we go through life and we find things, we hear voices that we connect with and they sort of tell us, they make you think, um, I think I could do something like that, you know? Um, which is why I think it's so exciting to be, you know, where you guys are, like reading a million different things and reading things that you don't necessarily know about starting off or you don't necessarily know to seek out yet. Um, some of the best things I've read have been things that I really hated the first time I read them. <laughs> um, and to dislike something and then um, trying to unpack why you dislike it and to read it over a second time and find yourself starting to like it is a really like rich and exciting experience, I think. Um, but I do really relate to the dream world. <laughs> um, I think that I actually have a pretty normal memory, but I always feel like I have a really terrible memory. Um, I feel surprised by things a lot. Um, I feel like I walk into a room and the first thing I do is look at the ceiling <laughs> um, for some reason. Um, like, I think that uh, we don't give our dream minds enough credit for, um, for making possible a lot of the th like rational thinking we do and making possible a lot of the emotions that we feel in, in like regular rational life. Like, I think that when you see um, someone pouring a glass of water and for some reason it touches you, it's because it's like touching that dream space of yourself, like memories that you've had that you can't even access when you try. Um, so I guess maybe the answer would be that my real life is pretty abstract. <laughs> Uh, we will have a reception. You'll sign books, yeah. uh, and we have prepared candy cakes. Oh, so, really? oh as God. close as we could. That's the cookie smell. It's actually boxed yellow cake. Really? So we did it. <laughs> they're really they're. I would advise one. Just take one. Get yeah. a glass of water. They're very sweet. Um, <laughs> as they should be. As they as they should be exactly. So we have some you know food of light to oh come my God, in that's you. That's the and, best. Thank uh, you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> <laughs>